My, my son told me this morning as I was uh, in my office um, uh, praying, he's like, he, he said, he came in there and he gave me this, uh, this little note and it's a, it's a big heart and it, was, it has all of um, uh, his siblings' names, Cesara, Jazz, Zion, Justice, Mommy and Daddy, love you very much. So he says, he said, go tell the people at the church this and show it to them. So I'm just uh, delivering a message to you that uh, he wants you all to know that he loves you very much. He looks forward to Sunday. I asked him the other day, I was like, son, do you like school? He said, I like school, but it's okay. I like church much more. I like the people. I like my, and, and, and the funny thing is that he, he, he considers some of y'all his cousins. He's like, they're my cousins. I'm like, how are they your cousin? He's like, well, we go to church together. Specifically speaking about Eli, but I was like, that's kind of weird. Okay, I guess me and Howard and, and Felicia are related. But the thing about it is that in the body of Christ, that's the reality. We are just brothers and sisters. Amen? Amen. Our elder brother Jesus is, is our brother. We have one father. We have one father. I, I, am, I am deeply honored this morning because my brother, my, my personal bishop is in the house. Bishop Paul. Please, please stand up and greet the people real quick. All the way from Texas. Now, let, let me tell you something about when you realize the level of someone's commitment and friendship to you. He was invited out to California to go and help celebrate another pastor's celebration. I think it's a birthday party or something, right? And they have their church service happening right now. And he told them, I'm not going to be there for church service. I have to go to my church. So he chose to come here. And then he'll go to their celebration, the party and everything afterwards. I was like, but you're here for them. He's like, no, 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 no. I go to my church when I'm in California. I come to my church. So... So you're going you're gonna to hear from, uh, from him a little bit later on, and um, later on I'm going to invite up Pastor Richard to come up here and minister with us, and uh, B Bishop Paul Bolu, and also Pastor Scott, we might have you come up here as well um, uh, as we continue in our discussion, in our, in our conversation. I want to allow you guys to participate too. Um, uh, last week we, we, had, we started a message, and uh, t today I'm hoping to kind of uh, bring it to a, I don't know if it's a close or a continuation. To continuation. It's a conversation we're going to have all year. But um, uh, let us pray, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll jump right in. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father God, I ask that you'd speak to us this morning. Give us words that transform, change our mindsets, our philosophies, our ways of thinking that have held us back, held us down, kept us from seeing your glory, kept us from giving you glory. Give us a perspective that is universal, that is eternal, that sees you at work in all things. I ask that you anoint me, anoint my lips that I may speak your words, that they may not hear me, but they may hear your spirit teaching them. Move the furniture in our life, in our hearts, Lord, around. Rearrange us. Make us over, Lord. Today I ask that you give us a makeover shift in our perspective. And Lord, as you bless us here at Relevant Church, I ask that you bless all the other churches that are preaching your word. We lift up our sister churches in this city, Harvest Christian Fellowship, the Grove Community Church, Sandals Church, the Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostals, Charismatics, Presbyterians, Calvary Chapel, our Catholic brothers and sisters, Seventh-day Adventists. Lord, thank you that there's such a diversity in your body. And we, I, I, Lord, today I, I also lift up all those who are trapped in cycles of religion where they think that they have truth, but all they have is a lie that's holding them down, keeping them from understanding that you came to give them freedom. Not restriction, but freedom to live the life that you ordained for them. So, Lord, if they would call upon your name, I ask that you save. I know that you save. In Jesus' name I pray and everyone shouts. Amen. 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 A few years ago at A&M University in Texas, there was a tradition that was started where, whereby the, the students at the beginning of the football season, anybody know that football is a very important religion in Texas? At the beginning of the football season, they, they would build a large 
uh, bonfire, and the students would engineer a unique design every year, something special that would signify the beginning of this important season of, of sport, and, and it would rally the, the students around the, um, uh, uh, this celebration. And this bonfire would be built, and, 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 and it would kick off the year. This happened year after year after year after year. It was a tradition. It brought about pride in the school, pride in the university, pride and connectivity amongst the students. Well, one November, as they were constructing it, they heard a crack. And all of a sudden, all the timber, all the logs that were holding everything, the structure together, began to fall apart, and several students were injured severely, and some of them died. And what was to be a weekend of celebration became a weekend of mourning. It was a tragedy. It was a tragedy that touched the entire state. Everyone in the state was in mourning. How, how can this happen? What will become of the football season? What will become of the school? What can, what can we do? After some time, the president of the university spoke up and he said, we'll take two years off. We will not have the bonfire kickoff. But during this time for the next two years, we are going to have a memorial service to remember those who were lost during this tragedy. However, in the third year, we will celebrate again. We will build another bonfire, and the tradition will continue. We'll start over. We'll celebrate once more. Starting over is very important. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's important. Turn to your other neighbor and say, sometimes you've got to hit the reset button. Especially when you're playing Super Mario Brothers. I remember playing Super Mario Brothers. I'd make the wrong move. I'd forget the A, A, B, B, up, up, down, down, and, and you know, the, the cheat code. And, and I'd say, oh, no, i got to start all over again. Sometimes you have to start all over again. No matter how bad it's been, no matter how tragic it was, no matter how deeply you're wounded, no matter how much they hurt you, sometimes you just have to go back and hit the reset button. Last week we talked about it. We talked about it. We said we have to give up the, re the, the need to know why things happened. being preoccupied and so stuck on trying to figure it out, wondering why, digging through the past, trying to figure out the past, trying to find the answer. Generally speaking, you'll get to the end of the answer and discover it's not what you wanted to hear. As a matter of fact, most times it's worse than what you wanted to hear. It's like digging a grave, hoping that you'll find life at the bottom. That's why you have to hit the reset button and just say, I'm starting over. Starting over is the essence of life. Starting over is the essence of Christianity. We are the people of the second chance. Oh, man, I'm, I, I wonder if there's anybody in here who's glad that God has given them a 4,222nd chance this year alone. <laughs> this year alone. You're like, thank you, God, that I get a second chance. I love the book of Jonah because in Jonah chapter 2, after Jonah has rebelled, it says, and the word came to Jonah a second time. That's my Pentecostal, let's have church moment right there because even though I made a wrong turn, even though I rebel against God, God comes back and he picks me up and he says, listen here, dummy, I'm going to use you once again. You may have taken a wrong turn. I'm going to give you another lifeline. I'll give you another chance. <laughs> oh, man, let's, let's keep it on in Super Mario Brothers because he here in Super Mario Brothers, when you were playing, anybody remember Super Mario Brothers? <laughs> Greatest game ever invented after Pac-Man. <laughs> but there was, there was this thing, you know, you do the cheat code, the little A, A, B, B, left, left, up, up, down, down, select. <laughs> right? And all of a sudden, you'd be given unlimited lives. You remember that? When you get unlimited lives, you can never die. And I, I was thinking about it the other day, Tommy, and I was like, oh my goodness, Christianity's the cheat code. 
once I stepped into life, once I said yes to Jesus, I got into a situation that no matter what the devil tries to throw at me, I got the cheat code. Though he slay me, yet I will live again. Yeah. I get a second chance and a second chance and a second chance. Now, I will not use my second chance to go back to the same old crap that kept me down. Let me very, be, be very, very clear. Some of you are like, well, we're Christians now, so we, we, get, we get a second chance. I, 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 you know, you got to give me grace because God gives me, gives me grace. No, if you're using grace that way, you don't even understand grace. You don't even understand the, the price of grace. You don't even understand the fact that he went up to a cross and bled. He became so disfigured so that you could have life. And if you're using grace as an occasion to sin, you were never saved to begin with. You were never safe to begin. You need to start questioning your Christianity if you use it so flippantly. Did he say that? He did. He did say that. That doesn't sound so like Jesus. Oh, yeah, we'll turn some tables in your life. We'll whip up on some fools up in here. We are the people of the second chance. We are thankful for the second chance. We blow it. We, 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 we fall. We, we maim other people. We, become, we get hurt by people. And, and, and most of us, we never talk about the people that we hurt, but we hurt people. And you're looking at me like, no, 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 I've not hurt it. I'm in church because I don't hurt people. I've been around a lot of church people. Church people are sometimes worse than not church people. At least people who don't go to church, you know where they're coming, which agenda they're coming with. Church people will come up to you and say, brother, I love your sermons. They're awesome, but I hate whatever they say. Come home with your heart and you're like, you really can't believe that this ha I thought they loved me. I thought that they were believers. They were be liars. We blow it, we crush, we maim, we fall over, our projects fail. But how do you deal with failure? How do you deal with past pain? How do you, feel with, how do you deal with, with wounds and, and trauma from the past? How do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? Everyone experiences failure in life because life is never an unbroken chain of victory. It's not an unbroken chain of victory. As a matter of fact, I'd like to submit to you that most of the people that keep on winning fail way more than you've ever failed. It's as if they're anticipating another way that won't work so they can get to the one that will work. Hurry up and let me fail. Hurry up and let me just fall down on my face. Hurry up and let me make a quick mistake so that I can correct it. We need to be failure positive, like this was a fail, we learned a lesson, we move on. Rather than building a monument on our failure and allowing that to become the definition of our life. We fail, we get setbacks, we have losses, and sometimes defeat can seem to overwhelm you. Truth is that sometimes failure is a result of the mistakes that we made sometimes. Most times, you don't choose your failure. Are you with me? Sometimes you don't choose. How do I say this? Like, I, I, I've, I've, I've given you the, this idea, this concept before. Uh, the algorithm of this planet is to keep you down because this planet is evil. If you're looking for, 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 uh, for fairness on this planet, it does not exist. It, Jesus said it this way, in this world, you will have fairness. Oh, so, oh I'm sorry. And some of y'all are mad because it's not fair. Things aren't fair. Things aren't equal. Things aren't, but opportunities aren't given equally to everyone. In this world, you will have what? Tribulation, that's what he promised. He says, it, I, I was at a, a private mastermind 
A mastermind is, a, is something that I believe that everyone should be a part of. A mastermind is when you're in a collective of people who are trying to progressively attain worthy ideals, okay? A group of people that are, are connected not for the sake of, of playing spades and, and, and having barbecue, but rather getting together simply because we are trying to move forward, and I don't move forward unless I have a collective of people that are moving forward with me. Can I give you a plus lesson real quick? If you, if you will notice, almost every innovation comes from a certain region in technology. What's it called? Silicon Valley. How come a tech company doesn't pop up in Idaho and then there's one in Mississippi and then there's one in Alabama and then one in Michigan and one in Wyoming? How come it doesn't work that way? Because there's no mastermind principle taking place there. Usually, when there's a collective of people over here gathered, sharing ideas with one another, all of a sudden, I see his failure and say, oh, it didn't work that way. Let's work together and figure out what will work. All right? You're you getting that. It's a plus lesson here. If you're only hanging out with people that play spades and have barbecue with you, you're with the wrong crowd. Find a group of people that's saying, we're going to move forward in life to make changes, better marriages, better spirituality, better, better communities, better, better. We're just trying to get better together because we're better together. Amen. If all your people are just people who bring you down or people who keep you the same, people who are like, who are jealous of your progression, you're in the wrong crowd. I'm way off my notes. I don't care. We're going to hang out. I want to hang out here for just one more minute. Oh, man, okay, how much time do I have? All right. Two more minutes. Evelyn, here's what I discovered. Um, uh, most of the people that I grew up around, most of the people that I grew up around, if you shared their, your dream and said, I want to become the president of the United States, they would not say, go for it. That's awesome. I can see that in you. Most of the people said, you? Ninja, please. <laughs> Does that sound like your life? Sometimes you have to let go of those people and say, okay, it's cool to get around, you know, on the 4th of July, maybe once a year, but most of the time, I want to hang out with folks that are trying to move me forward. People who are who are, who are failure positive. When I fail, they don't laugh at me. They say, go do it again, brother. I, I, I was watching what you were doing, and it seems as if you had the right idea, but you just needed to tweak it this way. And perhaps, you know, as a matter of fact, I was reading an article that the, the law of magnetism works this way. It's very interesting to me. In a room, generally, people who are thinking alike will attract to each other. If you find yourself being negative, you'll find negative people to be around. If you find yourself to be trying to do something in life, you'll find people who are trying to do something in life. And even if though it's different, you'll inspire each other. And when you fail, those people will lift you up and say, do it again, try it again. And so the th Silicon Valley, it all happens in the same region because there's a mastermind principle taking place. In the church, you can become a stronger and more mature believer when you do not forsake the gathering of the brethren. Isolation is the root of all failure and sin. Are you with me? Let's get back on, on topic. Well, it is topic. <laughs> so, Job chapter 17. Job, I won't get into the story of Job, but Job fails or he experiences loss. Failure is thrust upon him. <laughs> I don't want to get on the whole story of Job. But even in Job's situation, God was just kind of like to the devil, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take everything from him. Take his family. Take his money. Take all that. Do not take his life. I'll allow it. Pastor Muzz from Australia said, God laughs at our problems. Why would he laugh at our problems? When he said that, it kind of hit me in the, in the core, like, oh, don't say that God laughs at my problems. He laughs at your problems because he sees the other side. So I'll allow it. So Job experiences some stuff. 
but he finds himself in a mastermind of two friends who are like, what did you do wrong? What's wrong with you? Just take your own life, bro. This sucks. This sucks for you. Sucks to be you, bro. So we find Job in Job chapter 17, verse 11, saying these words. He says, my days are past, my plans are broken off, and so are the desires of my heart. He's experienced loss, and now he gets to himself. He's like, this is where I'm at. My plans are broken off. My days are past. My, my, I, I blew it. I lost it. I no longer have days to look forward to. And because of this, my desire of my heart is in the same place. Now, now they're, 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 it's very important right now to, 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 to point out that there's some of you in, in, in this building this morning who are like, this message is not for me. Life is good right now. This year started out good. My fitness plan is working out. The money's coming in. My family's healthy. Things are awesome. I needed to go to another church. I should have been at Harvest today. <laughs> this is not what I ordered. Wrong message, Pastor. But... I might as well go to Instagram and Facebook and just, you know. I'm, I'm just trying to give you a vitamin today. Because the thing is that you're going to face it in time. And when you do, I just want you to be prepared. So just take notes today and then pull it out when you face failure. It's, it's inevitable. Some of you are in that pit right now. And this is what you, just what you needed. Others of you are like, this is not a message for me because life is. And those of you who are in the pit are looking around saying, everything happens to me. Nothing works out for us. I'm starting to give up hope. I'm starting to give up hope that you're hearing from the Lord. I'm starting to give up hope from, from, from the word of God because nothing works out on, on my behalf. It seems as if things compound in the worst way possible. I've got a word for you. You will fail and fail and you'll fail. You'll fail. You'll fail again. You'll fail once more. You'll keep on failing, but you're not a failure until you quit. You're not a failure until you give up and you give in. And you let go. And you say, this is the summation of my life. As long as, as long as, write this down, as long as I was on the wake-up list today. As long as I was on the wake-up list today. Write that down. As long as I was on the wake-up list today. Morning by morning, new mercies I've seen. So I just want to give you five reasons why perhaps you, you've experienced failure, five reasons why things fell apart for you in your life. Would you like to know them? Okay. I told you you need to give up the reason to know why, but because some of y'all are stubborn, I figured I'd help you out a little bit. Five reasons, five causes of failure. Number one, we fail when we don't plan ahead. We fail when we don't do what? Plan ahead. If you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. fail. In Proverbs 27, verse 2, it says this, The prudent sees danger and hides himself. The simple go on and suffer for it. The prudent see danger and hide, him, hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. If you've had a happy-go-lucky Life. Maybe it's not really happy-go-lucky. That's, that's a worse word, way to, to, to describe it. A, a few weeks ago, we talked about how um, uh, we were talking about Jesus, and it said that he grew in wisdom and in stature. And stature meaning that you are operating at the level of operation based on the season of life that you're in. You're getting this, right? There is a part of your life where others make plans for you. 
your mommy and your daddy. And then there comes a time where you start making decisions and plans for yourself. Are you with me? One of the strangest things about our generation is that um, uh, the inoculation of the robber barons who wanted to build up a, a, um, a, a society that would be filled with employees and consumers that would buy their products over and over and work in their factories is that they wanted to prolong the childhood of adults. And how do you do that? Let them fail in planning their own life. Can, can I draw it for you in a picture? Let me, let me draw it for you in a picture. I'm, I'm, I'm not a good artist whatsoever, but I'm great at it. <laughs> so, Guess what I drew? It's, it, I, I drew a hand. <laughs> but did I really draw it? I traced it, right? Some of us are living lives that have been drawn for someone else and we're just tracing. My father told me, he said, son, we're from Africa. There's America, Australia, whatever. When I was getting ready to go to college, he said, son, what do you call the study of this? Geography. What does the word geography means, mean? Geo, meaning world. Graph, meaning to write. Write your own world. Do not trace your life after me. We fail when we fail to write our own world. We fail when we're living a life where we're just tracing around someone else's vision, someone else's imagination, when God has called you to write your own what? World. Are you with me this morning? Make plans. Proverbs 16, verse 9 says, The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. I've been around church people who say, Well, the Lord establishes the steps, and the heart of man may make plans, but the Lord is the one who establishes, brother. So I know you have these grand plans, but just know it's God who establishes it. Let me tell you, that's not what the proverb is saying. The proverb is saying, Make some plans. Make some plans and walk in the plans. And if it's a plan that's according to God's will and desire for your life, he'll establish it. He'll say, you were on the right track. But make some plans. Write some things out there. Are we together this morning? Luke chapter 14, verse 28, you can look it up later on. It talks about a, a, a man building a tower. It's, it's a great story. I don't have time to go into it right now. But the thing is, is that we fail and we, we fail and we fail sometimes and we get broken and all that kind of stuff simply because we don't plan. We don't have a plan. We don't have a life plan. We don't have an agenda. We don't have a, a, a two-month plan. We don't have a two-week plan. We have a, li- a plan that is just day-to-day. You get money and you spend money. You get money and you spend money. You don't even know where the money went. Why don't you know where the money why are you broke? You're broke because you don't know where the money went, because you never had a plan for the dollar. Yeah. Let me dispel a, a myth. I, I, I used to really believe that um, uh, people who had money were just stingy. Anybody ever 
felt that before? Come on, let's be honest. People who got money, they're just stingy, greedy, rich, poor, just bastards. I hate those guys. <laughs> Why? Because I, I knew some wealthy people, and they never would, they never would like, you know, help anybody. They'll never just like, you know, you think that because they got the money, they're just going to give and help out a cause and all that kind of stuff. No, I discovered the reason why they would say no to some things and would not just throw their money out there is because all their money was planned for something. Broke people never had plans, and so whenever they, they became impulse buyers, the things that the robber barons designed you to be because children are impulse buyers. Grow in wisdom and in stature. Am I helping you this morning? Yes. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's talking to you, not me. <laughs> number two, we, we fail. Number two, we fail when we think that we have arrived. We fail when we think that we have arrived. The moment you feel as if no one can teach you anything is the moment that you're ready to fail. Pride comes before Whenever you feel as if you've arrived, you are, you are on, on the right track to fall flat on your face. I, I had the audacity to ask one of, one of my mentors recently. <laughs> we, we were in San Diego and we were hanging out for the day. And... Um, as we're hanging out, we're at the hotel. He, he was staying at the hotel. I drove down to just spend some hours with him while he was in this hotel. And, and so we're in the lobby, and you've got the bell staff and the, and the waiters and the different people, you know, mingling about in the hotel. And I noticed something about him is that every time someone who was, um, uh, uh, you know, part of the staff of the hotel came around, he would treat them amazingly. He'd be like, so tell me where you're from. You know, and he would ask about their life, and, and, and he'd be genuinely interested in them. And, and this is a man who's, like, successful beyond successful, and, he, and he'd just lean into their life and, and, and ask them for advice on, on, a, on a project he's working on, and what do you think about this? And, and, and so finally I was like, hey, man, um, why do you waste time talking to these people? He says, they're born and created in the image of God, and they have a lesson I can learn from says that the moment you stop being teachable is the moment that you don't deserve to teach anyone anything. Yeah. Leaders are learners. Leaders are learners. Mentors have mentors. Anyone that's ascending, they're only ascending because they're taking in the data, processing it, no matter where it comes from. Are we together this morning? So, um, uh, you, you, number two, you fail when you, believe, when you believe and you start thinking that you've arrived. Number three, we fail when we're afraid to take risks. Uh, Proverbs 29 verse, verse 25 says this, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. The, the fear of man lays a snare, but, but whoever trusts the Lord is safe. The fear of man. Now, the thing is this. A lot of times we look at a passage like that and say, the fear of man. I don't fear man. I don't fear man. I only fear God. But really, it's talking about sometimes the fear that you have as a person. That fear is a snare. It's a trap. Fear is a trap. Faith is where there's safety. Are we together? The more you want to be in a place where you're certain of everything, can calculate everything, can figure out everything, is the moment that you're set up for a major fail. I, I wish, today is my um, 11th year anniversary with my wife for life, Pauline. She's my wife for life. She may not like me sometimes, but she's my wife for life. I may not like her sometimes, but she is my wife for life. I, 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 I had a revelation about my wife for life, and I, I embraced it so much, I went and bought the domain, mywifeforlife.com, before Tanisha French could buy it. <laughs> I already bought it, mywifeforlife.com. 
my wife for life. She's my wife for life. I wish 11 years ago that when we were getting our, uh, standing before the altar and, and, you know, we're saying all the lovely I do's and all that and, and I love you, uh, do, 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 all that kind of stuff. I wish that at that time, at, before they said, and now I pronounce you man and wife, I wish that the pastor would have pulled from his back pocket and here is the manual and the operating system that will help you figure your wife out. I wish that at the reception, as her parents were doing the toast and, and, and sharing their words of wisdom and advice to us, her father would be like, son, we have watched her, we have observed her from, 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 from birth, and, and here is how she thinks, how she ticks, here's what she likes, here's what she doesn't like. No, it didn't happen. We are just thrust into this thing into uncertainty, and you get nothing about dating prepares you for marriage. I don't care how many, you, you need to go through a marriage counseling, single people, come on. You, you need to do it. However, when you get into it, you're just going to be like, you're just going to look at each other like, oh. I did not know that women fart. My wife doesn't, but. <laughs> it, was a great, it was a great 11 years, y'all. It was, it was great. It was great. We, we enjoyed it, and we produced four wonderful children. But however, on the day of our wedding anniversary, I said some things that uh, she probably, she's probably thinking, no one told me that. Once we get married, I'll be the use. I'll be, I'll be the sole subject of every sermon illustration. <laughs> and all my business will be put out there. Single ladies, don't marry a pastor. Don't marry a communicator. They're studying you. It's a risk. Marriage is a risk. Dang, man, <laughs> this is for free. Go on that date. It's a risk. If you have fear because you don't know it's going to work out, that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to keep you, keep you alert. Go ahead and commit to that thing. You'll figure it out along the way. My wife is writing a book called You'll Get Ready on the, on the Way. Go for it. Going back to school is a risk. It's a risk because you know that you are not good at math ever in high school or grade school because they programmed you to thinking that math had problems. Math doesn't have problems, it has equations. You just gotta balance it all out. But the robber barons wanted you to think that everything is a problem, so don't go for hard things that are problems. It's a risk to start a business. It's a risk to apply for something that you know you don't have the qualifications for. Don't worry, they'll train you. There's a YouTube video for almost every situation in life. <laughs> you can learn. All you have to be is one step ahead of the rest of them. Amen? Take the risk. Go for it. Do it. When you start fearing what people will think, you're already doomed. When you start fearing what the voices in your head will think, you're already doomed. Sometimes you need to tell the voices in your head, shut up. I'm going after my destiny. Shut up. I'm going after my destiny. I know that's not God speaking right now. That's my fear speaking. And fear has to bow down because at the name of Jesus. Sometimes you need to go ahead and preach to yourself. I'm not going to stand for this. Cuss out those voices in your head. Shut up. That's not me. That's not, that's not being the head or the... You're trying to keep me the tail. I'm not going to listen to tail thinking. Woo. 
Pastor Richard will tell you, don't be afraid to go out on a limb because that's where the fruit is. The fruit is always on the limb. It's always on the limb. The best, the juiciest fruit is always on the limb. It's never at the, at the most safe, secure part of the tree, the trunk. You have to go out on the limb and just fear falling a little bit. But if you'll go out there, God will bless you with a life of fruitfulness. Are you with me? Number four, why we fail, we, we fail and we, we, we get wounded, we get broken and all that kind of stuff, is, is because we, we, we fail because we give up too soon. We give up too soon. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, Do not grow weary in well-doing, for in due time you will reap if you do not give up. Number five, we fail because we don't listen to God. We don't listen to God. We listen to Ray Ray Bubba, <laughs> Becky and Shaniqua. Listen to what they think. Listen to what our parents think. We listen to what our parents think. Parents are horrible. <laughs> parents are horrible, man. I thought I had, I was getting ready to write a children's book because I was doing a good job. Zion, spectacular. Zara, fantastic. Jazz, creative as all get out. Justice, my God. My God, that, that boy is handsome. I'm afraid, sheesh, I'm afraid of what, I don't even know what he's going to be like if he, takes on any of the characteristics of his siblings. So the other day, I, I'm upstairs in my, in my bedroom taking a nap, which I take once a year. <laughs> I was so tired, I had to take a nap. And I could hear the kids playing outside in the backyard. So I, so I got up, I'm like, they're playing in the backyard right now, and I'm, I bet you Pauline is not even watching them. She's probably, doing, she's probably doing her hair. She's probably thinking, oh, they're in the backyard. Because I could hear them playing. Like, and I hear jazz chasing them. And see, the thing is, is, jazz has no fear. Jazz will look at fire and be like, yeah, fire! Ah! Fire! I'm burning! Fire! <laughs> Pauline's probably in, doing something. I'm like, I'm like, oh, I better get up and go watch this. Side note. Criticism is an addiction. We'll talk about that later on. We'll talk about that later on. After 11 years, biggest revelation I've had over the last month and a half about myself is that I am way too critical of my wife. And it's becoming an addiction that I have to break. Why is it an addiction? It's an addiction because what I'm saying is that I don't want to take responsibility for what I need to do, and so I'll criticize you to do it instead. Don't say amen, just say, Pastor, you need to change. <laughs> Someone's sitting there like, oh, she's probably doing she's not even watching. He's like, hey, what are you doing? You're here laying in bed, taking a nap. She go down there and help her out. No, I'm not going to go down there and help her out. She should be doing it instead. So I got up and I at least started watching them through the window. And they're running around, they're running around, they're running around. And all I'm thinking about as they're running around playing in the backyard is where they can fall, what they can run into, where they can, how they can get hurt. And I'm like, and, my, and I'm filled with anxiety like, no, kids shouldn't run in their backyard. Don't have fun. It will lead to you getting hurt. I open up the window. I'm like, kids, you're running and having a good time. Stop it. You might get hurt. And it hit me. My very own father, who told me to write my own world, sometimes will look at the moves that I'm making in life, even though he took greater risk in his own life, and say, 
don't do that. I know the pitfalls. I know what it felt like to fall down on my face so many times. I don't want you to go through that pain. And sometimes as parents, we can hold back the destiny of our children simply because we don't want them to experience pain that we experience, but they need to experience their own pain. And if you are trapped in a mindset that's trying to please up to your parents, you will never see where God is leading you because he didn't want you to trace your life around them. He wanted you to write your own world. So how do you deal with past failure? Oh, no, I didn't get you number five. Did I give you number five? What was the number five? We don't listen to God. He said this. He says, my ways are not your ways. My ways are not your ways, right? Do you know what that means? I know you've heard what that means before. It's like, you know, it's God's ways are not our ways. Even in your dreaming, in your visioning, in your planning, God's ways will always be higher than your ways. The moment you get to the point where you think, I can do this, I can, I, I'm able to attain this level right here. That's the moment where you need to say, scratch these plans. What's an environment of the unknown that I can step into that's above and beyond me? Because that's where God lives. Are you with me? I've told you this story before. I was in um, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. It was my, my, I had a, a, little, a small little call center marketing business. It was growing rapidly. But it was one of those, whenever you start out in business, you, you, um, uh, you get into a situation where you pay all your employees and then you don't have anything to pay yourself. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Reality, because you're in an environment of risk. So I paid all the bills, and I personally had $3.48 in the bank. And I was like, man, we're doing well. And I got a phone call from the Chamber of Commerce, a representative from there that said, you know what, we're having a special dinner for all the uh, young entrepreneurs and business leaders in our community. We'd like you to come out to the steakhouse. The steakhouse was crazy expensive, and I went to the steakhouse, and I sat down, and, and, and they brought us the menu. You know, you, know, you know that you're in an expensive place when the menu is leather <laughs> and has suede parts to it. And I'm like, I'm like oh my gosh. Uh, this is more expensive than my clothes right now. I mean, I'm just like, I open it up, and, and, and it's like, you know, you start looking at the menu from the right-hand side. I'm like, hmm, Caesar salad. I'll have Caesar salad. I'm doing a special diet right now, you know, kind of cutting down on red meat, but I wanted to be with you guys, but I'm, gonna have, I'm just going to have a salad. Everyone's getting steak, ribeye. This is Nebraska. This is Omaha Steak Place. I mean, it's like they make beef. It was invented in, in Nebraska. Man, one of the top tier steakhouses in the home of beef. And I'm ordering Caesar salad. I eat the Caesar salad. I'm like, mm, this is so good. I feel, I feel so much more energy since I started this diet. Everyone's like, great. This steak is amazing. Come around. It was like several courses that came around. Finally, dessert comes around, and they're like, "Would you like any? Would you like to see the dessert menu, Mr. Belima?" I'm like, "No, may I have some water? It just really cleanses your system." <laughs> After that nice salad. At the end of the dinner, the host stands up and says, "Well, gentlemen, thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, by the way, keep your wallets away. The dinner was on us tonight." <laughs> Is it too late for me to order? <laughs> because we come into life based on what we bring to the table. And whatever you bring to the table is not the capacity of God. Are you with me? His ways are higher than your ways. And, and if you start stepping into his ways, let me tell you something. He will always take care of the bill. He'll always take care of the bill. Oh, yeah, five of us got that. The rest of us are like, I don't know. I don't know. 
It's not about you. It's not about what you bring to the table. All, all he wants you to bring to the table is faith and your planning. Are you with me? Don't bring my ability and my strength because you'll end up at, at the end of the meal looking at everyone with their bellies full, being rolled out of the restaurant because they ate so much, and you're like, I'm ready to go to the gym. <laughs> you getting this, y'all? So, I'm gonna wrap this up in five minutes here, maybe. Maybe, we'll see. So how do, you, how do you get past all this? I have, I have four points that help you overcome this, but I'm going to distill it down to one point. Is that okay with you all? You ready for it? Stop regretting and start repenting. Stop regretting and start repenting. Stop regretting and start repenting. Stop regretting. When a memory of your past failure pops up, your past trauma, your past, whatever it is that's been holding you back, stop regretting it and start repenting. Stop regretting it, start repenting. Why? Because repent in Greek literally means um, uh, uh, to change your mind, to look a different way, to change direction, to change your heart. Stop regretting. And in that moment where that guilt pops up, whatever that memory of failure is that's trying to hold you back, that's trying to keep you down, that's trying to keep you from experiencing you writing your own world when that shows up instead of being stuck in regret stuck in the past that's the moment that you repent and you say I'm not gonna live here I'm turning around from that thought and I'm moving ahead where God's taking me <laughs> moving ahead to where God's taking me change my people get over yourself and repent 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, if you can pop that up real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, it says, it talks about godly sorrow, godly grief, and, 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 and worldly grief. It says, for godly grief produces repentance. What does godly grief produce? Godly sorrow, godly regret, whatever it is, re produces repentance that leads to salvation or life without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces what? Death. Worldly grief, worldly sorrow produces death. Death to your vision. Death to your relationships. Death to your opportunities. Death to everything good that could be coming into your life. When you're stuck in the regret and the grief of the past that the world is posing on you, you never experience life. Whenever God pops a memory into your, into your mind about your past, it leads to a place where you say, I am going to change my mind, my philosophy, my, my thinking, my mindset, my, 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 my methodology. Shut up. Get over the idea that this is who I am and this is how I am and that's how it's going to be. No, that mentality is keeping you broke busted and disgusted. It keeps people far away from you. You become that prickly porcupine person that nobody wants to be around simply because you just want to be who you are. That's godly. I mean, worldly grief. Are we together this morning? Change. Change. Because godly, regret, godly grief will lead you to a place of life. So, so, so let me wrap this up real quick, and I was going to, okay, we'll figure this out in a second. Perspective of life. My son and I were having a conversation, we were taking a walk, and, and, and Zion said to me, Daddy, the world is a circle. I'm like, yes, how did you know that? He says, because I saw the pictures. He said, but if it's a circle, how come I never see where it bends? I was like, well, son, it's a good question. Ask Siri. <laughs> I was like, son, I, I, used to, I used to wonder the same thing. How come, if the world is, is a sphere, how come I never see the bend?
sometimes my problems, although there's a turn in my problems, a turn in my failures, sometimes my perspective only sees a linear path that keeps on going. <laughs> it's all about perspective. Are you with me this morning? And the thing about it is that if, if, if all I see is a linear path, I get depressed, I get, I get messed up. But then I read in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. How did he create it? He spoke circles. Sun, a circle. And the sun circles in the universe, and then he created uh, Mars, Jupiter, uh, Mercury, and Venus, and, and, and he made them into circles that go around a circle. And then he created moons uh, for the earth, and, and that moon goes around in a circle around the, 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 the earth, and, and, and the, the circle of the earth itself is spinning on its circle. And, and these circles that spin are a reflection of the nature of who he is, because the circle represents eternity, something that never, ever, ever ends. And these circles govern and create time for us. And the seasons are based on the revolutions of the circle. The day and the night is based on the revolution of the circle. He created a world into circles. And the circles spin and they spin and they spin. And, and Jeremiah, Jeremiah the weeping prophet, um, uh, God tells him, says, Jeremiah, I want to show you something. I want to show you something. Go down to the potter's house. Go down to the potter's house. I'm going to give you a sermon illustration. So Jeremiah goes to the potter's house and he finds the potter working on his on his pot and he's spinning the pot and as he pumps the, the pot spins and spins and spins and Jeremiah chapter 29 or ch chapter 18 says it's spun it's spun but somewhere in the spinning it says that the, 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 the pot was marred in the potter's hand it was broken in the potter's hand. The vessel was broken as it spun because spinning comes with risk. It comes with risk. It's spinning. It's spinning. It's spinning. And he, and, and he sees that it is spoiled in the potter's hand. I wish I had a church in here. I've been broken. I've been wounded. I've failed. I've been spoiled. I've been marred. But I've been in the potter's hand all along. All along. Even though my world is spinning and it feels as if it's going to go out of control, I'm still in his hand. And though I am broken in his hand, he crushes me and he breaks me. But when he's breaking me, it's not because he's destroying me. He's putting me back together again so I can continue to spin and spin and spin. Oh, my Lord. See, the thing is this. I was, I was having uh, uh, a couple of drinks with a buddy of mine. And, and, and we were talking. And as we were talking, he said, bro, I just feel as if I've blown it. My life is just, you know, I feel as if I lost it somewhere along the way. And it's because sometimes in life, we look at our life as if there's no bend around the corner. We think of our life as a linear timeline. I was born over here, went to grade school, bullied. At the age of 13, I, I messed around and lost my virginity. That cascaded into all kinds of trouble and drama. And then I graduated high school after dropping out first. That was a major shift. I went to college. I've been at RCC for nine years. <laughs> Had a good job. But one day I got a little bit too ambitious and I cussed out my boss because I knew more than he did. And then I got fired. And since that moment, I have not been able to hold down anything worthwhile as employment. But I got married along the way. We had a couple of kids. And while she was at work, I had an affair with the neighbor. And I lost that marriage. And now you're over here and you're thinking, my life 
is a complete mess because of this mess up and this mess up, and you've blown it along the way. And all you see is, all I have to look forward to is death. As Job was talking to his friends, my desires and my days are past. And God's like, listen, my son. When I created the world, I made circles and circles and circles. And your life is a life that reflects my life. Your life is circles and circles and circles that represent seasons. That represent seasons. If a farmer plants here and misses the harvest because of a bad crop, he knows that next season he can plant again. He knows that he can start again and there'll be another harvest. And if this harvest produces little fruit, there'll be another season where he can start again and produce again and do it again. Let me tell you again, we are the people of the second chance, the people of a new season, the people who can begin again, the people who know that there is no end in God, but rather there's another season. It's going to come again. You didn't blow it. Your season's not up. God has something left for you. If your marriage has flatlined, guess what, my friend? Seasons, circles. It was marred in the potter's hand. He never abandoned you, my friends. Circles. I don't know where you're at in your life, in your career, in your walk with God, in your talk with God, in your self talk. I came here to tell you that your days ahead will be greater than your past. That was the revelation that Job had when he had a revelation of who God was. He said, my ladder will be greater than the rest. Why? Because it's a new season. It's a new day. A fresh anointing is coming your way. It's a season of and prosperity. It's a new season. It's a new season. It's a new day. Everybody stand up on your feet. A fresh anointing. It's coming my way. Season of it's a season of power and prosperity. It's a new season. It's a new season. Come on, if you believe that, raise your hand right now. want that for your life. Know that God is saying he's going to start it again in your life. Start it again in your marriage. Why? Because of a resurrection and prosperity. It's a new season. Father God, I pray for your people people you've called by name, those that you love. I ask that you'd remind them that their walk with you is a guarantee of a new beginning. May they know that every year that they have a revolution around the sun and they celebrate a, ce a, a birthday, it's just a new start on another level. They can build again. They can dream again on another level. They can start again on another level. You make all things new, God. Their past does not define them. 
it gives them more determination to make your name true in their life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God a great big hand of praise.